Good morning, everyone. Glad to see you. They said it rained. Is that true? <laughs> we were practicing and thunder, and I just thought it was God's drums, you know, just adding the thing, whatever it was, but glad you made it through. Um, apparently, the stomach flu is making its rounds because uh, Bess and maybe everybody has it at her house, so um, uh, we'll remember them in our prayers. I would just uh, say, ladies, uh, the study today at four o'clock will be in the Cooper House, not over here, but in the Cooper House, okay? And VBS is coming up shortly, and we usually do, um, uh, you know, there's Friday fun day on, on Friday of VBS, and the next Sunday we usually have kids come and, and they sing, invite all their parents. We're going to have a cookout that day. Uh, it will be in the backyard unless it's raining or 105, um, it's maybe, uh, but it's going to be brisket and uh, pork butt and all the fixings and all you do is show up, it'll be ready. If you want to bring a dessert, you can bring a dessert, okay? So uh, that'll be the Sunday at the end, the VBS Sunday, I think that's two Sundays from now, okay? All right. Any other announcements for us this morning? Okay, Chris, lead us in worship. Good morning. Our um, call to worship this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses, uh, let's do 3 to 10. I was going to do a little less, but decided to go a little more. Um, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In the love, he, predest he predestined us for adoption as sons through Christ Jesus, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us the beloved, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all his wisdom and insight, making known to us the mysteries of his will, according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ, as, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Reading this, I kind of thought back, you know, about chose us before the foundations of the world. And I was thinking, you know, times in life when you're chosen for things, whether it be sports teams, organizations, events, you know, projects at work, you know, when you're chosen, what do you do? Well, you show up and you play and you give your best. If it's for a work project, you show up and you give your best. You know, and just thinking about that, being called, being chosen, you know, we all need to show up and make sure we give our best. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for this day and the time we have to come together and worship and praise you. Thank you for this church and its leadership and staff who show up. Lord, you are the creator, and in these verses we see your plans before time began, that we were chosen in Christ before the foundations of the world. Lord, for those of us who know Christ as our Savior and our Lord, may we show up and faithfully follow the path that you have laid before us. Share the good news and be salt and light in this world for you. And Lord, for those who may not know you, we pray their hearts and their eyes be opened to you so that your love and mercy are known and they will also be salt and light in this world for you. Amen. Good morning. Let us stand together and sing hymn number 82, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
Join me now for our prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, we do long to come and, and sing praises to you. Lord, forever for the things that you have done for your people and for the great things that you have done for us. And God, it is so easy to forget how richly you have blessed us, Lord, both materially as well as spiritually. Lord, you have uh, given to us the greatest gift that we could ever ask for in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, slain for our sins, offered as a sacrifice on our behalf. And so, Lord, we pray that you would allow us this morning to come with grateful and thankful hearts, uh, Lord, regardless of what has gone on throughout our lives this week. Lord, that we would remember your goodness, remember your grace. Uh, Lord, that our praises would rise from within our hearts. We ask this, Lord Jesus, in your glorious name. Amen. Let us sing now our praise song, May the Peoples Praise You.
Let us affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. Brothers and sisters, what do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The other day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the, <clears throat> the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our unison reading today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. A command to the, the covenant people in the Old Testament, to the parents especially, to keep their souls and to teach their children and their children's children, what they have learned and what they learned from the beginning as they grew up about the law, about the Lord and his sovereign care, remind them of the wonderful things that he has done to preserve them. So let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are reminded every time we open your word of your care for us, of your sovereign rule over all this earth, over our very lives, we're also made aware from plenty of examples of those who fell short of that, those who would remember and then not remember, and, and remember but still go forward in, into sin. And, and, and Lord, we're, we're not far from that. Often we stray, and, uh, but you are faithful, uh, and, and you call us back. And, and sometimes uh, you have warned us, but you allow us to go and, and face uh, the consequences, but you are always there with us uh, to watch over us, and you, we are never out of your hand. Uh, Lord, we uh, are reminded of those whose bodies who are, are touched by disease and, and how they need to uh, hear this in particular, that even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of uh, pain that might be prolonged, uh, you are there, your care is steadfast, you do not waver in your attention to us, and you, we are never out of your sight or out of your mind, for we were in Christ before the foundations of this world were laid. Lord, we think of Miss Ann and Miss Bunny and, and, and the, the Destas, Lord, as they all seem to be, be ill. And we know that there are others within our congregation, Lord, who need your uh, particular care, uh, those who might be uh, battling against cancer, those who... Uh, have other diseases, those maybe, Lord, whose hearts are heavy uh, and, and can't figure out why, those whose uh, mind might be uh, 
muddled, Lord. We, we pray for clarity. Those who are searching out uh, the truth and, and need to know, Lord, that you would bring clarity to their eyes and their hearts. And Lord, that we might be uh, faithful declares of what is right and what is true as we come alongside those within our family or those in our circle of, of friends that we know are in need. Lord, that whether it's just a, uh, a shoulder and an ear to listen and, and perhaps to, to be there in presence or whether it is uh, the godly wisdom from your word that is needed, make us wise, Lord, that we would uh, communicate and do the right things as we care for those around us. Um, Lord, we think of our uh, missionaries that, that we have seen last week and some more coming up who go to some real uh, dangerous places. We, we thank you for your faithfulness and care and pray that they would be wise and, and, and to walk in the path that you lay out for them and their families, that you would protect them, Lord. Uh, our missionaries, whether they be in the Middle East or in Europe or here in this country, Lord, our church planners, uh, those who are, are working hard to present the gospel in places, Lord, that it, it, it has not taken root yet, or perhaps in lives that have never heard the truth of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Use them, Lord, as your instruments uh, to open their eyes that they may know the things of Christ. Lord, we come to you in his name, not on our own efforts or our own merit, but on only the merit that is provided for us through the blood of Christ. We pray together the prayer that he taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we are grateful for your faithfulness. Just remind you that the plates are at the uh, exits as you come and go, or you can just uh, send it into the office. And Megan is uh, graciously going to sing for us today. Healing in his sad 
open our Bibles this morning or turn in your worship folder to 1 John chapter 2. And if you're able, would you stand with me as I read the word of God? Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would open our eyes, give us insight, give us remembrance. Send your Holy Spirit to fill us with understanding of your word and how we are to live because of it. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 24 through 27. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it is taught you, abide in him. This is God's inspired word for us today, so please be seated. So lots of uh, abiding there, meaning living in, staying in, uh, dwelling in his word. Um, if you abide in the Son, then you have the, know the Father, because those who don't have the Son don't have the Father. We saw that in previous uh, passage. And he says, I'm, I'm writing these things to those who are trying to, about those who are trying to deceive you. The false teachers are out there. This is all part of what's going on that John is writing to correct. Um, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Now, this is not going to be your usual Central Presbyterian sermon. And you may go, oh, finally, something, uh, something different. Uh, no, no, it's still from the word here, of course. Uh, but we're going to focus on verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. Now, as I read this passage and began to, to think upon it, my mind was taken back to Miss McElvain's Sunday school class at the First United Presbyterian Church of Houston, Pennsylvania. And we met in the basement, and it was the basement of an old church. Uh, and she was an old school teacher about, well, she seemed tall to me then, but as I became an adult, she was pretty small. Uh, but she was a powerhouse of teaching children God's Word. And it was under her tutelage that I dutifully memorized the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, and the 23rd Psalm so I could receive my Bible, my King James Bible that had the zipper around the edges. Okay. Now, we had this card. It sticks in my mind very clearly, and every time that you would uh, come to Sunday school and you would say, uh, Ms. McElvain, I'm going to do the 23rd Psalm today, and if you did it just as it was written, you got one of those big shiny stars that filled in the spot. Uh, and when your thing was filled in, we had the whole Sunday school came together and everyone there got their Bibles. Um, of course, being King James and, and being third grade, it's a little hard, um, but we, we stood with it. We kept with it. 
Now, what I'm looking at there is those things that we memorize when we are children. They seem to stick with us. Now, I had a friend uh, who uh, grew up, and he did the required, in, in his Sunday school, the required sword drills. Now, how many of you know what a sword drill is? Okay, especially if you have any Baptist background, a sword drill is... Um, 1 Kings 12.32, first one to 1 Kings 12.32 and stands up and reads it, they're the winner there, okay? And they would do that again and again and again. So he had to do the sword drills, he had to memorize the catechism in Sunday school, and he just about had it up to here with it. And when he left the house, he was going to go finally do what he wanted to do. And the, his first stop was the bar, and he was going to drink just as many beers as he could that day. And as he's waiting for the bartender to give him his first beer, the only thing in his mind was the catechism and all those passages that he had memorized in Sunday school. He said, I never did get that beer because he was just over. It was the only thing in his mind that came to his mind at that time. Scripture gives us a lot of guidance concerning what we should teach our children. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a principle. That's not a guarantee. Because we've seen many who have been steeped in the scriptures as they grew up and even into adulthood, but never actually believe. Um, but it's the principle. Do these things for your children, just as we, re we read out of Deuteronomy. This is what you do as part of the, being within the, the covenant family you teach your children. Deuteronomy 6, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So we see uh, the phylactery that might be worn here, or uh, if you... Um, have ever seen a household that had a little indentation right at the doorway? That's where they put the word of God. Just one verse there. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. How on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on earth and that they may teach their children also. So this was the command from the Old Testament. We run to the New Testament now. What does it say about this? Then children were brought to him that he may lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for such things belong to the kingdom of heaven. Now that doesn't really talk about teaching children anything, but it talks about how we are to approach the things of the Lord. Okay? You remember there was a time in your life when mom or dad said it, and that was gospel truth. Hopefully they haven't gotten past that, okay? But that was the truth, and that's pretty much how he's commanding us to go to the word and to go to the Lord. If God says it, that settles it. 1 Timothy chapter 4. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the savior of all people, especially those who believe, command, and teach these things. So that's what you're supposed to do. Teach these things, especially to those within your family. Now, it may or it may not surprise you, depending upon what you've read and, and seen, but Sunday school, as we know it, is kind of on the decline and has been for quite a while. Now, let me give you some history about Sunday school, uh, if you don't know where it came from. It originated in Britain in the 1780s and during the time of the Industrial Revolution. Now, children were part of that, so they worked six days, and what that produced was a bunch of ill literate children who didn't know how to read and write. So a, uh, an Anglican uh, uh, Englishman 
who was a key leader in starting Sunday school, said, we're going to start schools, and the only day that we have to teach the children how to read and write is Sunday, hence Sunday school. But, of course, their textbook for learning to read was God's Word. And how did they learn to write? They wrote down portions of God's Word. So it spread to America, of course, and churches everywhere began to create Sunday schools. In fact, the it became so popular in the 19th century, uh, in the 19, uh, middle of the 1800s, that just about every household, if there were children, the children attended Sunday school, whether or not the parents went to that local church or not. And although Sunday school started as a way to educate children, as I said, the Bible was the textbook. Um, so that was the way that it worked. And, and as children uh, left the workforce, as those rules came in and they kind of got out of child labor uh, and started going to church regularly, starting going to school, Sunday school shifted more to specifically teaching them God's word and as an evangelistic tool. But over the last 30 years, the term Sunday school has been used less and less in churches as it has shifted more towards what they think are contemporary models and wording and methods. Now, in, in, um, we still do it here, we, Sunday school, but most, uh, not most, a lot of modern churches only have uh, worship and they count on small groups, whether they be adults or children, to do the education at other times. Um, this model is fraught with danger if you don't have very good oversight over it. Um, so if, if uh, somebody comes on Sunday morning here, a child comes on Sunday morning, there's Sunday school, and then if they're small, uh, up to whatever age it, they leave on, sorry. Uh, mine aren't in that age group, so I'm blanking, but then they go with Miss Sarah or Miss Bess or Miss Megan to children's worship. And there again, more education into God's word. Now, when surveyed as to why Sunday school appears to be in the decline, this is what the experts say, those in children's ministry. The model is outdated. It's tough for churches to maintain that model. Today's parents place more importance on sports than church when given the option for Sunday mornings. I can remember a, uh, an article, this was years ago, and I don't think this is quite the title of it, but... Will your son throw a 90 mile an hour curveball in hell? Okay. And you can imagine the thrust of it was what are you teaching your, especially to dads, what are, what are you teaching your children? What is the most important thing they're going to teach you? How to throw the curveball? Well, you're going to do it fine, or are you going to do it in hell, or are you going to do it in heaven? Fewer families coming to church mean fewer kids in Sunday school. Sunday school feels like school to children. The divorce rate and the changing family dynamics mean parents stop coming to church. Teachers and volunteers are hard to come by. Parents will only commit to one hour at church, not anymore. And there's a cultural shift in the country. Now that's the experts, that's what the children's ministry experts, that's what they say. But you'll notice that most of those reasons are practical in nature. The need for volunteers, competing with sports, etc. But the real question we have to deal with is what is the spiritual importance of teaching young children the gospel truth? Do we rate that as a priority in our lives? Now, one children's ministry expert, and I'm, I'm put experts in, in quotes here was asked what she thought of the value of continuing Sunday school. Okay? Should we continue Sunday school in the midst of all these obstacles? She wrote, The two things I find most valuable about Sunday school in its current iteration are the relationships kids build with adult volunteers and other children and the fact that Sunday school offers children a place to belong in the church, especially in a very large church. What was not included in those two reasons? Instilling the knowledge of God's word in the hearts and minds of children. Okay, now, we, we make some assumption in, in Christian homes that that's going to go on at home. But remember, it needs to be a conspiracy. They need to hear it at home. They need to hear the same thing at church. It would be great if they heard the same thing at school, but that's no guarantee. Perhaps your neighbor's homes, the activities are involved. It all has to work together, okay? 
So her view was not, that, that it was not valuable because it instilled the knowledge of God's word into their hearts. Many of you will remember the book, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Okay? Classic, classic book. Why? Because it was so simple. It was so simple. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the mantras um, that we learned from the Navy SEALs, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Okay? Sometimes the simple things are the deepest truths and they are the most important. So what did Robert Fulgham learn in kindergarten? Share everything, play fair, don't hit people, put things back where you found them, clean up your own mess, don't take things that aren't yours, say you're sorry when you hurt someone, wash your hands before you eat, flush, well, it's important. warm cookies and cold milk are good for you, yeah. take a nap every afternoon, when you go out into the world, watch out for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. Those are, those are truths, okay? Now, he goes on to talk about, as an adult, that these lessons, that these truths are still with him, okay? And very much a part of his life. Now, how is this possible that after all these years, the myriad of facts that have gone through this guy's head, he still remembers these lessons from kindergarten when he was six years old? Now, there's a lot of neuroscience behind this that I, I, I read this week, and I'm not going to give you all that. You can go and look up about uh, how we learn and, and why some things are still prominent in our minds that we learned when we were small, but it is one of those truths that they stick with us, and every philosophy, every cause, and every ism that is out there is aware of the potential of putting their thoughts and their truths in the minds of children. And then the payoff that comes later. I'm gonna quote from the neuroscience here. Uh, from birth to approximately six years of age, a child's brain works in very different ways than an adult's brain does. At this age, a child's mind is like a sponge, soaking up huge amounts of information from the world around it. The absorption is effortless, continuous, continuous, and unfortunately indiscriminate. They will take in the good and they will take in the bad just as readily. The things, the things a child sees are not just remembered, but they form part of their soul, so to speak, part of their character um, and, and personality this is one of the reasons since 1983, and the researchers have gone back, and, and this was the year, for whatever reason, this was the year that, that they saw this change. Since 1983, programmers and creators of children's TV programs have been introducing steadily increasing sexualized themes and have increased the number of characters reflecting those themes. Between 2017 and 2019 alone, there was an over 200% increase in LGBTQ characters, stories, and stories in children's programming. Children's classics, DuckTales, My Little Pony, SpongeBob, Scooby-Doo, Blue's Clues, Arthur, all have those characters, all have those themes in them. A review of the content of cartoons, now, you may like cartoons, but they're geared at children, found 259 characters portraying those beliefs and images. Warner Brothers and Disney are the biggest producers of this information, producers of this philosophy aimed at our children. The sponge of the young mind will take in the good and the bad, and it will be with them the rest of their lives. Vladimir Lenin said, give me one generation of youth and I will transform the whole world. Let me educate one generation with my ism and I will change the world. Our passage this morning, verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. What I learned in Sunday school was gospel truth. 
Right? Now, it was not systematic theology. The, the six-year-old brain is not ready for Louis Burkhoff and his 800 pages of systematic theology. I wasn't sure that my 30-year-old brain was ready for that in seminary, but that's what you get, and you deal with it, and you work with it. But the gospel truth was simple. God created all we see. Sin entered the world. God flooded the world because of sin. God chose a people to be his. They let him down. He was faithful. A teenager can kill giants if he trusts God. Daniel trusted God, and he kept him safe even in a place he didn't want to be in. God sent his son into the world born of a virgin. He was sinless. He gave his life for my sin. He rose from the dead, and he will come again. Sometimes simple is more. More meaningful, more memorable, more important. As a child, when you learn the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, Matthew 7, 20, 7, 12, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them the golden rule, you learn gospel truth. Matthew 18, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. All right? It's simple. God said this is true. That settles it. It's not like God said it, I believe it, that settles it. God said it, and that is it. Everything after that, everything after God said, said it, is my attempt to assert my will and my view that I might know better than God. Isn't that what happened back in Genesis 3? God said, don't do this, and, and Satan came along, and they said, well, I think I know better than God. Here are some other things we learned in Sunday school Amazingly, from a book that's titled, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Sunday School. God's love is a gift. Gifts are to be shared. Life is not always fair, but God is just. We all sin, so practice saying, I'm sorry. We all have to say it a lot. The Lord commanded a Sabbath so we would remember that life is more than work, and Sunday afternoon naps are not a suggestion. Be careful, little hands, what you do. Because your body is not your own, you have been bought with a price. He's got the whole world in his hands. He designed us to need each other because they entered the ark two by two. Running from God usually means you wind up in the belly of a whale. God will always meet you in the fiery furnace or in the lion's den. God answers prayer. When our friends are sick, we should take them to Jesus even if we have to lower them through the roof. Jesus can do a whole lot with very little. You won't believe what he can do with a sack lunch. And God created us to sing, or at least make a joyful noise. So we're going to have a little test here in a moment and see how much of the songs you remember. Now, why did we spend so much time singing in Sunday school? Well, music makes even the most difficult things easier to memorize. Perhaps you had a list of things at some exam that you just couldn't get into your mind, so you put it to a song. And sure enough, there you are taking your exam and you're going, you're singing, you know, you're singing it and you're writing it down like that. I can't recall my computer password, but start the tune on the radio of a song from my teenage years, and I'm just singing away. I know all the words. I know all of them. Neuroscientists, again, have long debated the brain's mechanism relative to memory, but they all agree on one thing. Information set to music is among the easiest to memorize. A quote from Henry Rodiger, who was a professor at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, he explains how songs stick in our brains. The hippocampus, the frontal cortex, are two areas in the brain associated with memory, and they process millions of pieces of information every day. Getting the information into those areas is relatively easy. What's difficult is pulling it out efficiently. Music, he says, provides a rhythm, a rhyme, often alliteration, and all that structure is the key to unlocking the information stored in the brain. Music acts as a cue to release that. Why is it 
that if I said, um, let's sing Great is Thy Faithfulness, but there's not going to be any music. I just want you to recite the words. And you're, you're thinking, uh, but as soon as Robert starts, great is thy faithfulness, O God, our Father. We can do it, okay? Miss Virginia Upton, those of you who knew her, she hadn't been able to see for years. Why is it that she could sing all four verses of every hymn we ever did? Because they were in her brain because of music. What about those songs that we learned when we were children? And the theological content that they taught us. Jesus loves me. This I know. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves the little children. Red and yellow, black and white. From every tribe, tongue, and nation. Okay? You're getting this. This is is a theology that we got as six-year-olds. But we're not realizing it until we connect it with the other passages in Scripture. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see, because what goes in will stay in there. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Give me, I don't know the, the motion says, give me oil for my lamp, keep me burning, burning, burning. Keep me oil. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Now, there it is, okay. He's got the whole world in his hands. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got joy like a fountain. There it is. That key is very good. There you go. Right on. I didn't even have to do the climb, okay. All right, I saved the hardest one for the last. Father Abraham, there we go. Father Abraham had seven sons, and his sons had Father Abraham, and they never laughed and they never cried, or something like that. How do I know that I'm a son of Father Abraham by faith? Because I learned it in a song in Sunday school, and it sticks with me. Now it's part of my soul. Nothing really creates that lasting thing in our brain as does music. Now, a few, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I'm sorry, I, I wrote, wrote a newsletter article kind of encouraging you to take a break from media input, okay? Uh, turn off the, the arguing people on the radio or on TV. Whenever you can, just listen to Christian music. Fill your minds with those things. Since that day, when I wrote that article, I said, well, I, I got to do it. I've listened to nothing but Christian music in my car. Nothing but Christian music in my car. I don't watch TV news. I don't listen to it on the radio. I read it, but I don't listen to it so that they're not arguing back in my head. Uh, So I've reduced my intake. What has been the results? The first thing I notice is that when I wake up in the morning, I have a song in my head. It's a Christian song. This morning... My heart is filled with thankfulness to him. Some of you, it's a Getty song. Oh, man, it's good. And then I went, I, I, I let the dog out, and then I'm singing uh, what we sang last week. Jesus strong and kind, okay? And, and it just went on and on like that. What about other music? Well, I'm not taking it in. I'm just filling my mind with that. When we remember those songs we learned, Like he's got the whole world in his hand. The simple truth is communicated to us. God is sovereign. Why? Because he's got the whole world in his hands. He's sovereign over everything and everyone. And in the larger scheme of, of time, I might not get what I want, or things may not turn out the way I want them to be, but I've got what? Peace that passes all understanding. I learned that in the song. I've got peace like a river. And I've got joy down in my heart because Jesus loves me. This I know. The Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. 
Let's turn to 652, and that's what we're going to sing. Jesus loves me. Father, sometimes your truths are the simplest, so simple a child can understand them. But as we age, we tend to, to muddy them up with our own thoughts. Fix in our minds today the simple truths that we learned from the beginning, the things that we have sung about, the things that your word says, the love of Christ that was demonstrated to us as he gave his life for us, as he came out of the grave, and so will we. Fix these simple truths in our hearts, that they may shape all that we are, do, and say. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 